afternoon. Um, I'm Lynn Markey. I'm the director of the Coalition for Life Sciences. I'm glad you could make it today uh, for our last caucus of the 2017 season. I would like to thank the co-chairs of the caucus, Representative Steve Stivers, Representative Joe Barton, Representative Jackie Spear, and Representative Steve Cohen for making this yet another great year of caucus presentations. Today, we will hear from about advances in childhood cancer research. For most types of childhood cancers, the survival rates have improved in recent decades. However, some survival rates are very low for certain types of cancers. Consider these statistics. Every day, 43 children across the nation are diagnosed with cancer. 12% of the children diagnosed with cancer do not survive. We clearly have more work to do. Uh, today, we will hear from a researcher who is doing that work. He not only studies childhood cancer, but is also a childhood cancer survivor. Dr. Joshua Schiffman is a professor of pediatrics and an investigator at Huntsman Cancer Institute, medical director for the Family Cancer Assessment Clinic, and the education director for the program and personalized health at the University of Utah. He oversees a research laboratory at, at Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah, where he focuses on genomic development of cancer in children and studying animals that naturally develop more cancer, like our pet dogs, and studying other animals, like elephants, that are protected from cancer. Based on this research, Dr. Schiffman has co-founded several exciting new startup companies in the U.S. to impact cancer diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Dr. Schiffman's efforts focus on translating science to his patients at increased risk for cancer. Dr. Schiffman will discuss where cancer comes from in children, new research tools being developed to identify who is at risk for cancer before it happens, and exciting new approaches to treating and maybe one day even preventing cancer. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Schiffman. Thank you, Lynn, for that nice introduction, and thanks everyone for, for coming out during the lunch hour. Um, like Lynn said, I'm, I'm Josh Schiffman. I am a uh, pediatric uh, oncologist, but also a childhood cancer survivor. Uh, but what I do want to say from the outset, it's so great to be up here on the Hill and see everyone wearing their suits. And I think when I go back to the lab, I'm going to make it mandatory that everyone needs to wear a suit, because we'll probably get uh, more done, hopefully. Okay, so uh, for the next half hour or so, I'm going to go through and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what elephants, dogs, and kids all have to do with cancer and then leave time uh, at the end, hopefully, for a really great discussion. Uh, we always want to put out some disclosure. I'm actually involved in two different companies which we're going to talk a little bit about. And if I do my job right for the next half hour, uh, this lover of all things elephants, you too will share that uh, with me. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about genetic risk for childhood cancer, which kids are getting cancer and why. We're gonna talk about how do we identify those kids through collecting family history. We'll talk about dogs, and we'll then end up talking about elephants. But the first thing to really stress is, it's always about the patients, right? So in medicine, we're always focused on the patients. These are our guiding lights. So this little girl is Danielle. I first met Danielle actually when I was back at Stanford doing my training, learning to become a pediatric cancer doctor. Now, Danielle was a little unusual. She was four. She had childhood leukemia. Now, that's the most common pediatric cancer that we see. So that wasn't so unusual. It was sad, but not surprising, except for the fact that two years earlier, Danielle had had a brain tumor. So think about that. Here's a little girl. She has a brain tumor, and then she gets leukemia. And not only that, when we took the family history, we learned that her father had just died of a glioblastoma, right? And we're all familiar. This is a very deadly brain tumor. McCain is battling this right now, Senator McCain. Uh, but her father's brother also had a glioblastoma and had died from it. So in this one family, there was a lot of cancer going on. And we'll come back to Danielle in just a bit. Now, when we talk about the cancer challenge, what we need to understand is cancer is out there. Half of all men and a third of all women will get cancer, just to bring that into perspective. That means if we divided this room in half today, right? If we divided it in half today, everyone on, well, Lynn is walking over there. So everyone on this side of the room, guys are all going to get cancer if you haven't already. And just by a show of hands, I know some of you are eating and taking notes, but how many people know someone who's been diagnosed with cancer? Right, so look around the room. Everyone's hand is in the air. 
So this is the leading cause of death in the Western world. There are 1.6 million new diagnoses per year, 600,000 cancer deaths in the US, 14 million people in our population living, fighting cancer right now. Well, what about kids? Well, the NIH does a fantastic job supporting the Children's Oncology Group. This is a cooperative network, doctors all across the United States taking care of kids with cancer. And you heard this, every day, 43 kids, 43 innocent kids diagnosed with cancer. That's about one in 300 kids. There are more than 40,000 kids living with cancer in the US. I know you guys like statistics up on the hill, so here are all your statistics. But did you know in the last 20 years, there have only been three drugs specifically approved by the FDA for childhood cancer? Actually, that number is now four as of a couple of weeks ago. Only three, now four drugs for childhood cancer. And even though we're doing great, still one out of eight kids, right? 20% of kids are gonna die from their cancer. And we've made great progress, but there's still a long way to go because those kids that survive childhood cancer, the vast majority of them have a chronic illness or disease that they need to face or deal with from their treatment. Now, we all know about genes, not the kind we wear when we're not on the hill, but you know the genes are DNA, right? We have 22,000 different genes in our body. Every gene has a different job. If some of those genes are broken, or what we call mutated, then you have an increased risk for developing cancer. Some of you may have heard the breast cancer gene, right? Angelina Jolie talks about BRCA1, the BRCA gene, the BRCA2, BRCA1. If you add up all of the people in the US who are at risk for cancer because of their genes, that's 1.7 million people, right? It's a lot of voting constituents, right? A lot of people out there at risk genetically for cancer. And I don't mean like a 50-50 shot. These are like almost 100%. Now, when we have diagnoses of cancer, about 1 in 10 are due to inherited genetic risk if you're an adult. So that means if you have breast cancer, colon cancer, about 10% of the time, there's a known gene that we can find that says this is why you develop cancer. Now let's make it a little interactive. What do you think that number is for kids? If one in 10 of adult cancers are genetic, how many cancers in kids do you guys think are genetic? Just throw out a number. What's that? Any number. There's no right or wrong answer. Silent group, Lynn. I must be intimidating. It's the suit, I understand. Okay, so. It's actually about one in three, as many as one in three actually may be due to genetic risk. Now, when we've started doing our sequencing studies, that number comes closer to 10% of genes that we're actually finding. So when we go through the tumors and we do our fancy DNA tests, 10% we're coming up with at least known genes. But if you look at the family history of some of these kids, it is as high as one in three of these kids have a family history of cancer. So there may be other genes we haven't yet discovered. And that makes sense. If you think about cancer, I don't want to bore you with all of the biology, but where does cancer come from? We all have cells in our body. Every time a cell divides is an opportunity for that cell to develop a mutation and become cancer. So if you live a long time, that's why there's a high risk for getting cancer because you had so many cells dividing throughout your lifetime. But if you think about children, they haven't been around that long. Hopefully many of them haven't smoked or been exposed to environmental toxins. So with childhood cancer, it's skewed towards a genetic cause. All right? And one of those causes is something called Lee-Fraumeni syndrome. This was discovered by Dr. Lee and Dr. Fraumeni. Dr. Fraumeni was actually one of the heads of one of the NIH branches. And Dr. Lee and Fraumeni made this observation almost 40 years ago with these families getting a lot of cancer. And you may know families like this. It seems like they're cursed. The uncle, the brother, the cousin, the father, everyone seems to be getting cancer. And what we know is that the lifetime risk for, ca for cancer in this syndrome is almost 100%. 100%. Imagine what that's like being the doctor going in, talking to these families and telling them, you've got a sword of cancer hanging over your head. A beautiful baby here, but this kid is going to get cancer. 
often during childhood. And this is what I said Danielle's family had. And it's due to a mutation in a specific gene called TP53 or P53. I didn't name it. It sounds like something out of Star Wars, the C3PO gene, but it's really, it's TP53, okay? And this gene is very, very important. And in fact, we call this gene the guardian of the genome. When I describe this to the families that we take care of, I say, I think of a gene in its underpants with a cape flying behind its back, super P53. And whenever our cells are on the way to becoming cancer, P53 is there. Now, you have to pay attention to this part because it will link back into the elephants, okay? So P53 in humans, we have two copies. We get one from our mother, one from our father. You can think of P53, this superhero, this guardian of the genome, almost like a big spell checker, okay? So we all have DNA, all the letters and the cells in our body, and if those cells get changed, they're on their way to becoming cancer. You can think of them as like pre-cancer. And so what P53 does is both those copies, they fly in, they stop that cell from dividing so you can fix it, right? Because if you fix it, then it can't become cancer. Well, what happens if it's too far gone, right? if it's got too many spelling errors and the spell checker can't work, what does it do? It actually kills the cell. It literally puts a gun up to the cell's head, fires it, makes the cell commit cell death. A fancy word called apoptosis. Yeah, see, you know, you know what I'm talking about, apoptosis. We like fancy words in medicine because it makes us feel smart, okay? But apoptosis, all that just means is it's cell death. So this guy, P53, the single most important gene in cancer, I would argue, because its job is to keep people, and as we'll hear, animals, cancer-free. Now, when we talk about P53, it's not just patients with leaf romani syndrome. So P53 is actually involved in all human cancers. And this is a really important point I want to bring back, hopefully, during the discussion. So how common is leaf romani syndrome? It occurs anywhere in 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 5,000 people. It may be actually as common as 1 in 1,000, all right? So for those people who are missing P53, they only have one copy instead of two. They can't stop their cells from dividing. Their cells live forever because they don't have this P53 to kill it. That's why they get so much cancer. But what about everyone else? So it turns out that half of all cancers, and this is really interesting if you think about it, half of all cancers, whether it's a brain tumor, a colon cancer, a breast cancer, a prostate cancer, half of all human tumors are missing this P53 gene. It's broken. Even if they don't have leaf romani syndrome, they might have two copies in all the cells in their body except their cancer. Because think about it. If you're cancer or you want to become cancer, what do you want to do? You want to get rid of the police. Right? You want to get rid of the superhero. If that P53 is broken and not there, and you want to become cancer, that's a good thing, right? Because nothing's there to stop you. So even though leaf romani syndrome may be relatively rare, half of all cancers are missing P53. And if half of all people get cancer, and half of those cancers are missing P53, that means a quarter of the entire planet this gene becomes very, very important. So we can learn a lot about all cancers by studying a very small population. And what we've learned is that if we screen early, so I don't know if you guys know, this is called the Kaplan-Meier curve. As an oncologist, you always have to put these slides in your presentations. They make you sign something when you graduate from med school. If you talk to the public, you always show these. Again, it makes you feel smart. And what, boy, quiet audience today, Lynn. I guess it's, you know, the end of the session. So, all right. So P53, mutation carriers, patients with Lee Romani syndrome, they're at 100% risk for cancer. So what are you going to do about it? So you know they're going to get cancer. How can you stop it? Well, we're working, and we'll talk about this in a bit, we're working on medicines to try to decrease the development of cancer, but we don't have those yet. So we have to think of a way that we can find cancer early. We know with cancer, the earlier you find it, the better the outcome. A person with stage one cancer sometimes has 90 to 100% survival. A person that's stage four, where it's advanced and it's spread to the other organs of the body, survival is usually very poor, less than 10%. 
So we know these patients are going to get cancer, and we know we want to find it early. How do we do it? Well, we actually, working with Toronto and LA and other places and children's hospitals, we figured out a way to do whole body MRI. We actually put the patient in the scanner, and we screen from head to toe. And we know that if we find cancer early in those that have been screened, you can see there's almost a 90% overall survival after 11 years, all right, versus 60%, all right? So a third, almost roughly a third of patients who don't get screening are dying because their cancers are caught too late. So if we could be very aggressive looking for cancer early, we can save lives. Now, I know we want to see this actually in pictures. Pictures are worth a thousand words. So here are some of our patients in Utah. These patients had no symptoms. Think about that for a minute. They had cancer. They were walking around. They didn't know they had cancer. But we found it because we knew they were at genetic risk. Right? Isn't genetics wonderful? So we found brain tumors. We found lung cancer. We found colon cancer. The woman with lung cancer, she was training for a marathon. She had no idea she had lung cancer. Lung cancer is often deadly because by the time it presents, you've got symptoms, you're coughing, and it's spread. She didn't have any symptoms because we found it early and we knew to look. That's why genetics is so important. So how are we going to know to look early? Well, I don't know if any of you have kids, but you know what kids are, so that's important, right? And so when kids are born, we do something, and this is a national program, right? Each state runs their own division, but it's a national blood spot program. We screen those babies, right? So this, I have three kids. Each one of them went through this, two in California, one in Utah uh, when they were born. And you do a heel stick. You get a dot of blood, and you look for diseases. Well, PKU is a metabolic syndrome. And we know if we find PKU early, those kids can live a long and healthy life. If you don't find PKU, there's a lot of developmental delay, and they often die, and they have very poor quality of life. Now, PKU occurs in one in 10,000. Many of the state screening programs now are screening for diseases as rare as one in a million. One in a million. Why? Because if you can find them, this is for severe combined immunodeficiency, if you can find these diseases early, you can send the kid to a transplant, and they could live a long, healthy life. So if you can intervene, it's worthwhile to screen. Well, childhood cancer occurs one in 300. That's a lot more common than PKU and a lot more common than SCID, which is one in a million. But we don't have a gene yet for every single childhood cancer, but we do have a gene for leaf romani syndrome. There's no question. If we screen at birth, we're going to start picking up kids, and it may be one in 5,000, and I just showed you that if we do early tumor surveillance, we're going to start saving lives. And it may be one in 1,000. What we're trying to do now is get enough funding together because we have newborn blood spots that have been saved in Utah and around the country, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, to just screen them and find out, is it really one in 1,000? Maybe it's one in 500, right? And then we can start saving lives. But we know, and I don't say this just because I'm here on Capitol Hill, we want to be fiscally responsible, right? Fiscally responsible. So we've done studies, modeling, to look and see if we actually do newborn blood screening and we start doing these whole body MRIs every year, how much money are we going to save? Does it make sense? And when you add up the numbers, it actually does because you are actually going to save money in the long run because if you don't diagnose them early and there's almost 100% lifetime risk for cancer, their cancer is going to be diagnosed late and they're going to eat up a lot of health care costs. That's all I'm going to say about healthcare today. I don't want to get into it right now, unless you want to bring it up during the question and answer project, uh, part of the talk. Okay. So how are we going to really understand how to manage these kids and what we're doing? Well, in Utah, great state. If people haven't visited it, you should come and visit. We are collecting from all our pediatric cancer patients their samples, their blood, their tumor, to study in the lab. Now, that's great locally, but what can we do Nationally, here's the AACR slide for my AACR friend. Okay, so the American Association of Cancer Research is a phenomenal organization. And recently, they established a childhood cancer working group. They said, listen, childhood cancer is important too. So thank you, AACR. 
And this is really a working group whose purpose is to really advance funding, understand technologies, educational strategies. And one of the first things we said is, listen, pediatric cancer, it could be genetic. It is genetic. We need to understand it more. So a few of us put together a working group, and I show these not to have my picture up there, but to show my other colleagues, right? And we come from all over the US and even Toronto to say this is important. And we convened a group in last October, 65 participants, which is a lot of doctors in one room from 11 countries. And we said, we need to figure out how do we manage these kids with cancer? How do we identify them early? And this resulted in 18 papers from one of the AACR journals, which is now, they're publicly available. If you are bored or have trouble falling asleep at night, I mean, want some really exciting reading, you can go to the website and you can download them. They're all free for all of our colleagues. We even have started handing them out to patients when they come in to see us. And the bottom line is that we need to have a better way of understanding who's at risk for cancer. If the cancer risk is greater than 5%, then we recommend surveillance. If it's 1% to 5%, we have to understand what are the technologies available to us and how much could they harm the patient, what's the benefit, what's the risk. And if it's less than 1% risk, we say at this time, there's not enough evidence to recommend surveillance. Now, that's not very satisfying for those families that have rare diseases, but it's the best we can do in today's day and age with the technology. So this is all well and good, and this is great, but how are we going to identify these patients? Well, I'm going to put up this guy, Francis Collins. Some of you may know him. And he once said virtually every illness has a hereditary component. And that, I think, is true. And the best way to find a hereditary component is to think about family history. Okay, so what runs in your family? But here's the problem. All right, here's the problem I'm going to tell you. Clinicians don't do a very good job taking family history. So I don't know when the last time any of you went to the doctor was, but your visit was probably 10 minutes if you were lucky, okay? To take a good family history takes about a half an hour. So you don't just have time. You know, if someone comes in and they're sick, you say, well, you know, does anything run in your family? Okay, don't worry about it. We gotta focus on your ear infection or your throat or whatever's bringing you in today. But even if we had the time, which we don't, we don't have the expertise. I teach family history in the medical school in the University of Utah. And I have two slides on it and a covered in about three minutes in a 50-minute lecture. Doctors don't know how to take family history. We're just not taught. Genetic counselors are taught, but guess what? There's a national shortage of genetic counselors. So even if we had the time, we wouldn't know how to do it. Now, even if we had the time and we knew how to do it, guess what? Patients are unprepared. I won't pick on any of you today, but if I asked you what runs in your family, you probably wouldn't know. You probably have to make a few phone calls, right? And your parents might not know. Well, Aunt Bessie had the C word, maybe. Cancer, was it in her stomach or her ovary? I don't, no one talks about it. No one, no, no one knows what goes in their family. And even if we had the time, which we don't, and even if we knew how to do it, which we don't, or if the patients were prepared, their accuracy wouldn't be very good, right? It ranges from 30 to 90%. So what are we going to do about it? I just said that family history is the most accurate way, really, to predict, predict disease, even bigger than genetics. Because if you have a gene, it doesn't always mean you'll get cancer. But if it runs in your family, you better sign up for screening, OK? So we came up with this tool. We think of it like Facebook for family history, right? You guys know what Facebook is, obviously. I've learned I can really irritate my kids if I put a the in front of it. So if I say, do you have the Facebook? Then they get very upset. Do you use the Instagram, the Snapchat? Anyway, so you know what the Facebook is, right? So think of what I'm going to tell you. It's called it runsinmyfamily.com. It's a research tool. Think of it as the Facebook, right, for family history. You know your family history, so you fill out yours. Or you know your medical history, rather. You know what happened to you. So you fill out yours. Then you send a link to your mother. Your father, your brother, your sister, your cousin, they fill out theirs. Then they send the link to their cousins, their aunts, their uncles. And pretty soon, you have the most accurate family history there could be. Why? Because the people 
who have the disease are the ones filling it out. And then the secret sauce is we can overlay that with risk to disease. And we can say, hey, did you know in your family you have a history of breast cancer, so you should think about seeing the doctor so you could have a genetic test and get genetic counseling and go on and do the surveillance you need so we could detect cancer early. And I'm happy to say we are up and running. We're beta testing. We want every U.S. citizen to fill out itrunsinmyfamily.com. We're working to interface with the medical records so you can go to the doctor and when you sit down, you say, hey, guess what? This runs in your family. We should think about testing you. So I invite everyone. It runs in my family.com. It's still in beta testing, but go check it out, see what you want. We actually have had one of the co-founders who's working on this with me, Brandon Welsh at uh, MUSC in South Carolina. He has a K08, so an NIH-funded grant, a training grant to study this. We've submitted small business grants, and so we think we definitely want the government involved in this, right? This is good for all of us. Okay, now we're going to switch to dogs on our way to elephants. Everyone doing okay? All right, good. Comparative oncology. This is the idea that animals get cancer too. How many people have a dog? How many people know what a dog is? Okay, you're not raising your hand. We'll talk about that afterwards, all right? So I was going about my business many years ago, and everything was good, and this is Rhodey. Why? Because I'm from Rhode Island, so we named our dog Rhodey. See, so you like that, Kevin, in the back? Okay, so Rhodey. Rhodey was a Bernese mountain dog. People told me, Josh, don't get a Bernese mountain dog. They get lots of cancer. And I said, huh, I'm going to be an oncologist. What are the chances of my dog getting cancer? Well, guess what? This picture was taken when we first moved to Utah. And three months later, Rhodey was limping. And three months after that, he was dead because he had cancer. And it kind of took the blinds off. And I realized that there are a lot of dogs that are getting cancer. In fact, dogs get cancer 11 times the rate of people. I don't know if any of you have had dogs who've died of cancer, but it's, there's a good chance. There are six million dogs diagnosed with cancer every year in the US. Six million. There are only 1.6 million people, right? 90 million dogs in the United States, living, by the way, in 40 million homes. That's two dogs per household on average. We love our dogs, OK? And Cancer is one of the leading causes, disease-related causes of death. And talk about fiscal responsibility, right? The veterinary market is over $40 billion. But dogs offer an unbelievable opportunity to study cancer because they share many of the same diseases with humans, but the cancers are identical. You cannot tell the difference between a dog cancer under the microscope and a human cancer. The same exact genes, the same exact molecular drivers, and there are a lot more dogs getting cancer than humans. Take osteosarcoma. This is a rare, deadly bone tumor in kids. There are only 800, 800 new diagnoses of osteosarcoma in the US per year. Dogs, 50,000. So many people are starting to recognize that if we could test our drugs earlier in dogs, we could help people. And you help dogs too. In fact, it's so specific, you could say a dog breed, or you could say a cancer to a dog, uh, to a vet, and they'll tell you what kind of dog. So you say golden retriever, they'll say lymphoma. You say Bernese mountain dog, you say sarcoma. You say boxer, they'll say glioblastoma. Boxers, it turns out one in 10, maybe as many as one in four boxers, will develop glioblastoma. It's so striking that when a boxer, not the fighting boxer, but the dog boxer, right, goes into the vet with a seizure, you don't even need to do a scan. The vet knows that boxer has a glioblastoma. They're genetically predisposed. So we were talking about genetic predisposition in kids. Dogs are genetically predisposed for specific types of cancer. Why? Because many dogs are purebred dogs, right? Purebred is just a very nice way of saying inbred, okay? So purebred dogs have a genetic risk. They're like genetic time bombs for cancer. This offers an amazing opportunity to study early development and intervention of cancer. So we put together this trial. We haven't gotten funding for it yet. I should come back and lobby on Capitol Hill for funding. But we picked out the acronym. The acronym is the most important part of any study, right? 
So we call this the EPIC study, early prevention in cancer. Who wouldn't want to be part of an EPIC study, right? And so the idea here is boxers are all getting brain tumors, right? So if we can enroll enough boxers and screen them, now I'd like to say we would do a PET scan on a dog because that would be fun to say, or even a CAT scan because that would be ironic. But actually, it would be an MRI scan. That's the best way to find these brain tumors. But if we start screening healthy boxers, right, if one out of 10 boxers get brain tumors, if we start screening, if we screen 100 dogs, we'll find 10 with an early brain tumor. And then we can start to look at the genetics and understand where do brain tumors come from. We can start to intervene. We can try new treatments and really try to understand if we find brain tumors early, we may be able to make an impact and change the outcome and apply that to our human patients. I wanted to show this because here I am. Again, I keep mentioning Capitol Hill. It's not just us that believes that dogs offer a great model. The NIH has a working group, a comparative oncology consortium, and they've shown that you can actually save $117 million per drug development if you start testing and studying cancer in dogs. In fact, there are companies, I'm not associated with this one, but they're springing up. These are basically clinical research organizations. This one's called the One Health Company, and they help run clinical trials in dogs. So instead of running them in people, they run them in dogs, and they work with the pharmaceutical industry to do this. And this is really how we're going to make our advances. But what about the elephants? What do elephants have to do with any of this? Well, I'm going to spend probably the last five, ten minutes now talking to you about the elephants. So it's very interesting, elephant. How many people know about elephants, know what an elephant is? Okay, good. Hopefully, again, everyone's and still not you. You're taking notes, but that's okay. We'll assume you know what we're talking about. Okay, so elephants. Elephants are 100 times the size of people. That means they have 100 times as many cells. Elephants live 60, 70 years. That many cells dividing decade after decade just by chance alone, all elephants should get cancer, right? Because we were saying every time a cell divides, there's a chance of getting cancer. But there's a paradox. Elephants almost never do. Look at it this way. A baby elephant is born after 22 months of the mother elephant being pregnant, something my wife says wouldn't be a good thing. And those baby elephants are born at 300 pounds, also something my wife says wouldn't be a good thing. And those baby elephants grow from 300 pounds to over 10,000 pounds, putting on three pounds a day before they get old enough to have their own baby elephants. With that many cells dividing in an elephant, if they weren't protected somehow from cancer, all baby elephants would be dropping dead before they could have their own baby elephants, right? Makes sense. Then what would happen? Elephants would go extinct. And I'm here to tell you today that extinction is not a good strategy for survival. So somehow, elephants needed to figure out a way to protect themselves from getting cancer. Otherwise, there'd be no such thing as big elephants. Sort of make sense to some of you? Yeah, okay, great. Well, working with Dr. Carlo Maley at uh, ASU and a few other collaborators, we learned that elephants, instead of two copies of that P53 gene we were talking about, remember one in our cancer patients, two in normal humans, elephants have 40, 40 copies of the P53 gene, 20 times as much as people. And when we learned this, we said, well, that's very interesting, but how do we know those extra copies are what's protecting the elephant? We needed to figure out somehow, some way to work together with elephants. So I'm happy to say that we collaborated with Utah's Hogel Zoo where it turns out they draw blood from elephants on a regular basis to make sure that the elephants are healthy. So they're already taking blood work for their own veterinary reasons. So we said, hey, can we have a little bit of that blood and bring it back to our lab and study it? And they said, sure. That's actually a much longer story that I just truncated into about 10 seconds. It truncated, nice word, right? Makes me feel smarter than I am. Okay, so we didn't work just with the zoo. We also ended up working closely with the Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Circus in the Feld Entertainment Group because they have a lot of elephants too. And so working together, we figured out that this elephant P53 was very special. 
and actually was helping, we think, potentially to protect the elephants from cancer. And so it made a big splash a few years ago, cover of Newsweek. More importantly to me, it was in a little journal called JAMA, which we like to read in the medical profession. This was actually the second most popular article in JAMA when it came out that year. And the press went wild, right? There have been over 35,000 media reports around the world talking about elephants and cancer because it's exciting. And why is it exciting? Well, it's exciting because what does that mean for people? What are the implications? And so here you can see we're not going to spend too much time on it. You can look at the paper if you really want the details. Uh, but elephants have extra copies of P53. We showed that the elephant P53, when it's in the elephant cell, does a really good job of killing that cell. Remember, we talked about that word apoptosis. Elephant cells with their extra elephant P53, they're supercharged. You can look at an elephant cell funny, and it will die. And this is the way that they protect themselves from cancer. But again, this left us with a little bit of a problem of, well, how are we going to help people? Because it's great to understand why elephants don't get cancer, but when we talk about biomedical science and research, we want to help the citizens, right, of the United States of America. So what are we going to do? Well, the first thing is we needed to understand it a little better. So I'm going to show you some unpublished data. It's very early, but it gives you a sense of where we're going. So for the next couple of slides, what you're going to see are glowing cells. All you need to know about these glowing cells is that we put in basically a light bulb into them. And so that light bulb just makes it so we can see where the cells are and what they're doing and follow them. And we take cancer cells from patients and we put them in a dish. Okay? And what you're going to see over here on the, your left, all right, those are control cells. That's an oste it's going to be an osteosarcoma cell, a bone tumor cell taken from a patient glowing green and doing its thing. On the right, you're going to see the same cell, but it has an elephant cancer-fighting gene put inside it. A human cell, but the elephant cancer gene in it. And the only difference between the two, where you see green on the right, it's the elephant cancer cell turned on, linked to that GFP, and on the left is just the GFP. So look at the difference between them, okay, as they go here. So you can see they start growing and growing, and they start taking over the dish on the left because they're cancer, but on the right, they start shriveling up and dying, and they go away. Incredible. Here's another version of it. You can see the cells in the background moving around. Again, green is just the control on the left. Those are just regular cancer cells. But on the right, you can see the green goes away. I was so excited when I, saw, I posted this on YouTube. There are 10,000 hits. 9,999 are mine. I watch it every night before I go to bed and every morning when I woke up, right? Because it's so exciting. But it's not just osteosarcoma. We've gotten it to work in lung cancer. And again, this is in a dish, but you can see the cells on the left, they're growing and growing and growing, and on the right, they're shriveling and dying. Lung cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer death around the world. Prostate cancer, all right? So prostate cancer affects one in seven men. Look at the difference. On the left, they're jumping around, they're dancing. Right? They're doing the hokey pokey. They're all excited. But on the right, where the elephant gene is, they're shriveling and they're dying. This is in a dish, but you can imagine what it would be like in a person. Here's just a close-up. I want to show you this. My son likes this. He thinks it looks like Star Wars. Right? Watch this cell. It just explodes. It bursts. Because the elephant P53 is doing what it's supposed to do in an elephant, now in a human cancer cell. And finally, here's glioblastoma. Again, I know this is very important up here. Glioblastoma, a very deadly cancer, really not much of a cure. On the left, the cells are spreading out on the dish and taking over. And on the right, they're all shriveling. They're like popcorn kernels, and they're dying. So again, very promising, very early. We're even looking about putting it back into Lee patients in a dish and seeing can we help prevent cancer in a dish. OK, so this is towards the end now. Well, this is all well and good, but how are we going to help people? Well, in America, right, I like coming to Capitol Hill so I can keep talking about America and the United States and citizens. We're very entrepreneurial, right? And any good academician knows if they're worth their weight, they need to start a spin-off company, right? So we worked with our technology venture and commercialization company at the university, or office at the University of Utah. We said, let's start a company, Peel Therapeutics. Peel is the Hebrew word for elephant. We have an Israeli collaborator who has a drug delivery system, what we're working with to get the elephant P53 into people. 
We like to say a cancer therapeutic, 55 million years in the making. That's how long elephants took to become elephants, right? So a lot of research and development behind our company, 55 million years, not bad, right? And so we're working, we've submitted SBIR grants, right, or STTR grants, they're under review now, so knock on wood, we'll see what happens. But we're very excited about where this can go. Here's me and Dr. Schroeder. I'm making that face you should know not because of what I'm stepping in, because the sun is in my eyes, right? But we're really excited. Now, I'm always very careful as a doctor to say, this isn't the cure for cancer, right? There are many, many amazing scientists at Huntsman Cancer Institute and around the world. This is just one approach. We know that nature has figured it out for an elephant, and now we're trying to see, can we learn from nature and apply it to people? Right? We need to do our testing. We need to make sure there's no unanticipated side effects, right? That's very important. So I always say, we haven't found the cure for cancer. We don't want to give false hope. We don't want to overpromise and underdeliver to our patients. But we're very excited about the potential. And how do we test it? And this is the next to last slide. Well, we go back to the lab, right? This is why biomedical research is so important. This is a mouse, and in this mouse, what you're gonna see, this is one mouse imaged very differently by Dr. Jeff Yap at Huntsman. Right here is an osteosarcoma tumor that was implanted in this mouse, and you can see it as it's located. And we do lots of different imaging, and that came from a patient, a six-year-old boy with osteosarcoma, and that's osteosarcoma relapse. But we have it, we grow it in the mouse, and now we can start testing the mouse with new medicines. We can test, we think about this, this is a little bit mind-boggling as you walk back over right to the capital. Think about this. We have a mouse with a human tumor who's gonna be treated with an elephant protein. That's crazy. But it's not science fiction, it's real. It's biomedical research. So at the end of the day, here's what I'll tell you. Pediatric cancer is the largest, uh, it has a very large genetic component, right? More than adult can cancers. Early detection saves lives, but we need more studies, we need more funding to do surveillance and understanding how, how can we do really targeted surveillance. Family history is so important, and we have new exciting companies springing up and tools. It runs in myfamily.com. Please go use it. Tell us what you think. Dogs are an unbelievable opportunity to really understand where cancer comes from, but to do these clinical trials right, to make sure the medicines are safe, and then to take the leap forward to our human patients. And elephants, elephants rarely get cancer. So maybe, maybe just one day, if we're smart and we listen to what nature has to tell us, elephants could help us to treat, and maybe even one day, one day in the future, prevent cancer. So that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you to the patients. Thank you to all the funding. Look, NIH, NCI, that's right up there. Right, thank you so much. Here is our, our lab group. And then I'll end by this. A local bakery, actually they have about 55 stores across the Inner Mountain. They're doing a fundraiser this month for Childhood Cancer Month. And they're selling elephant cookies and all the proceeds go to help support our research. So, eat an elephant cookie, not a real elephant, an elephant cookie, and you too can help fight cancer. And then you can go, you could even order, you could ship them Right here, you can ship it. What, wouldn't your congressman or congresswoman love an elephant cookie? So please, thank you so much uh, for your attention, and I think we have time for questions. <laughs>